Okay, we are here today with uh, edition two of Talking Ohio State Recruiting and Ohio State on the Recruiting Trail with Mark Porter and myself, Bill Kerlick. And uh, Mark, glad to have you back. Mark is a veteran, as I said last time, of 16 years scouting Ohio.com. And uh, uh, now he's also with Bucknuts, and we're certainly happy he is. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Well, like I said, we, we've been on the Ohio State recruiting trail for, for a lot of years, and, and this year's been no exception. Mark and I go to a high school game virtually every weekend. Mark sometimes sees two or three a weekend, and uh, mine are all Ohio State-related. Mark's are, are Ohio State-related and top players in Ohio. Uh, so speaking of that, Mark, I, I saw Avery Henry, uh, the first playoff game, first round of the playoffs, was impressed with him. We talked about that last week. Uh, you had seen him last season, but I believe had not seen him in person this season, I think, uh, until last weekend in the playoffs where you got a chance to see the future Ohio State offensive tackle, again, Avery Henry from St. Clairsville in person as they played Bloom Carroll. What were your impressions of him this time around, Mark? You know, I just went through the same thing the Ohio State coaches went through. You know, I saw him last year, and, you know, we talked about last week. He was big, and he was impressive. But he was overweight, and his foot speed wasn't quite there. And, you know, th then you're making the guess, can he make the jump to big-time football? And, you know, the mid-major schools had all jumped in on him. Well, last year I saw him versus Bloom Carroll. 365 days later, I'm seeing him against Bloom Carroll again. So I got an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And the, and the weight loss made a difference. He definitely looked different in pass protection. He bended a little bit better, and he sunk his hips a little bit better. And they, St. Clairsville ran behind him almost exclusively. I had forgot how limited those teams were at that level, and they didn't have a lot of weapons. And really their weapon was him caving down the side of a line and getting their running game started behind him. Uh, unfortunately, Bloom Carroll's got some players, and, you know, they couldn't win the game. But, you know, I saw him all night because he was pretty much the only thing on that field uh, to zone in on. Uh, you know, he did make the jump from last year. And, um, you know, he, he, he is a large human being, no doubt, 6'8", 305 pounds now. And, you know, even with a 60-pound loss, he is a large human being and uh, a guy that moves pretty well. And, you know, it'll be interesting to watch him make that jump from small school, uh, high school football to the biggest stage there is Ohio State. But, you know, I, uh, I guess we – I guess we should talk about or mention, like, how he's large. Of course, he's tall, but when I, like, really dive into the minutia of him, his calves, his quadriceps and hamstrings and his, you know, his butt and hips area is just massive. You know, he looks like he's got the college build to him as soon as you look at him. And those areas are the areas where you want these linemen to carry all that weight. Because when you say a guy's over 300 pounds or 330 pounds or, you know, topping out, you think of these – sloppy fat guys with bellies hanging over him where he carries a lot of great weight in his broad shoulders his arms are thick and that's the kind of canvas you want to start and paint on when you bring him to a place like ohio state he gets into that weight room and he goes from big to mammoth you know and mammoth is what you need to move people around and you know zone block in the ohio state run scheme yeah and absolutely he is not sloppy i've commented this about this on buck nuts he is not sloppy he looks good so uh, yeah. uh, speaking of looking good, uh, it, it was not a great looking weekend this past weekend uh, for the teams that the Ohio State commitments um, play on. Unfortunately, all the Ohio State commitments, uh, as of right now, their commitments are out of the Ohio State playoffs. It was a tough weekend. Marysville, uh, Gabe Powers uh, lost. Sonny Styles, Pickerington, the game that I was at, they lost up for Arlington. Uh, Lakota West, uh, Tega Shabola, and Jair Brown, they lost. And then the game you were at, St. Clairsville lost. So we don't have any Ohio State commitments in the Final Four uh, that starts this weekend left. So uh, uh, let's kind of transition then and take a look at uh, some Ohio State commitments that you and I have seen this year that we did not talk about last week. And let's start with uh, Josh Padilla. He's an offensive lineman, Huber Heights Wayne High School. And I've seen him, I think, play three or four games in person over the last two seasons. And 
really have come away very impressed with him every time. Uh, has played right tackle for Wayne uh, since his freshman year, actually. Start, a varsity start at right tackle his freshman year, but has been recruited as a high, by High State first and foremost as a center, maybe a guard, but at least initially as a center. And I like this kid a lot. You know, he's tenacious. And he has the thing I always look for besides the physical things, and he's got the physical attributes, but he's mean on the field. You know, he wants to finish his blocks. He wants to win the battle and then go on to the next one if he can get a next one on that same play. I'm just very – I've been very impressed with Josh Padilla. I think he's got a chance to be, you know, another in the line of outstanding centers for the Buckeyes. Yeah, and, you know – when I saw him last year, I was so starstruck by Elijah Brown and all the other Division One uh, talent on that team. I almost overlooked him. You know, he almost went as like a second or third or fourth. You don't usually get to the fourth best guy on a team and think he's an Ohio State guy. But when he was with that class of guys, Emil Wagner and like the guys I'm referring to there, it was just impressive to think he was on their level, that they had so many guys on that team. And then from there, uh, we saw him again at the Under Armour camp this summer in shorts, and we saw him in pass pro there. And the progression with him is just like uh, we're talking about with Henry. These Ohio State guys, they make a jump from year to year, whether it's in quickness, explosion, uh, the weight room. He looks better like he got in the weight room. I, that's one thing I did notice. I looked at his arms, try to see how his uh, lower body was panning out. And, again, he could be inside a guard or center, moves very well. Uh, the word finisher you brought up, I love when guys finish and they have a, a game within a game going on where not only are they trying to win the football game, but they're trying to win – the battle against the guy they're assigned to every time. And winning means pancaking at guys at this level. And he's one of those guys. And he's, by the way, he's been, he was recruited uh, by Ohio State's offensive coordinator, Kevin Wilson, who did a great job recruiting him. And just, just a great addition to the program, I think. Uh, a, a potential addition would be uh, Austin Siverfelt from Lakota East High School. He's someone that I have not had a chance to see in person. I've watched him on film. Uh, I'm impressed with him. Again, he is kind of thought of as a tackle in high school, but is likely an interior lineman at the next level. Um, you know, again, I've been impressed with him on the film, but I know you've seen him in person, Mark. Yeah, I got to see him play Mason High School this year. And much like some of the other games I go to, he, he jumped right off the tape or jumped right off the field. And he's who I keyed in on. And I got a chance to I saw him for about 10 or 20 plays that night. And I tell you what, it was impressive, you know, and I was excited to see if it was just the team he was going against that night and, you know, do my homework, dig a little deeper. And, yeah, he, he's a finisher. He really um, exemplifies finisher. I mean, it was a tenacious type of attitude with him. Um, I really liked his feet. He has tackle feet. Um, I don't know if he has the tackle length that, you know, you want in college, but if he started off there, it wouldn't bother me. And then, of course, he could be an interior lineman. Uh, and, again, it's hard to believe there's that many – quality lineman in Ohio each year, and we got one in the Dakota East. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that um, uh, when he was – I should mention that I saw Tegra Shabula earlier that night in the first half and him in the second half, and I remember thinking, am I really watching two guys on that level again? Just the same thing I thought when I was at Wayne that night. You know, it almost – your mind plays tricks on you when, when you're like me and you go so many weeks looking for Mac guys and D2 guys, and you're like, man, these – Ohio State gems are really hard to find. And then in one night, you go from Lakota West and you jump over to the Mason Lakota East game, and you're like, wow, you know, am I just, you know, seeing something here tonight, or is this apples to apples? Is he really that good? And Severoveld is that good. And, and, you know, it's interesting. When he was offered by Ohio State, I, you know, he had only a few other offers, and uh, Toledo is one of them, I believe. Ohio U was another one. And then I think he had one other offer. And, you know, there were some questions people on our boards were asking, you know, is this a reach? Why is the highest state offering this guy? Well, lo and behold, over the last uh, couple of weeks, he's added offers from you know, schools that, that play a little football, like maybe Notre Dame and, and uh, Alabama this uh, last weekend where he visited there and was offered a scholarship. So people are catching on. This kid can play. Yeah, and just to do the math on that, um, most of the time the recruiting calendar doesn't have – a lot of colleges offering kids during the season. They're really occupied with their own stuff. And before you would offer a lineman, you probably want to watch 30 or 40 or 50 linemen to make sure, like I'm saying, he's not just an aberration and how he stacks up. He may look really good now, but if we watch 20 other guys, he may move down the board. 
So Ohio State has the resources and time to do that. They have the staff to watch all the films, break it down, be a cutting edge on players like that. Toledo and a few of these Mac schools will imitate that and try to get out in front so you'll see some early offers by a Mac school. But what really happens is when Ohio State gets into their recruiting grind, they're one of the few schools that can actually peek ahead and have a pure evaluation on a kid like this and understand that, okay, we've watched all the other linemen in Ohio. Here's exactly where he is. Okay, it's time to make the offer. Um, and then that just sounded the, the dinner bell for all the other bigger colleges. Once you know that offer went public, it's real easy for other schools to come in and put their name on it. And speaking of offers, um, another guy I want to talk about is Will Smith. Um, he's an Ohio State legacy at Dublin Kaufman High School. You and I both uh, have seen him this season. Uh, you know, just a tremendous young man, first and foremost. But uh, as far as the football player, he's a guy that doesn't have an offer from Ohio State yet, but it is racking up some, some nice offers now. And Ohio State uh, has had him up to uh, at least, uh, I believe, two of their games this season. He's obviously uh, interested in the Buckeyes when, when you're uh, in Ohio State legacy. That's natural. Um, he's a kid that uh, kind of plays end and tackle for Kaufman. I don't think he really necessarily has the length uh, to be a defensive end in college. I see him as a defensive tackle, and I see him as a kid that uh, uh, has some explosion and, 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 and moves well. Uh, a kid that I think has a chance to get an Ohio State offer. Uh, I saw him against Princeton this year, and Princeton actually beat Dylan Kaufman. It was a great game. And, you know, I, your evaluation right there where oh, he didn't have a lot of length. Coming out of his sophomore year, he wasn't that big. He didn't look like he was going to be his father. You know, like you're thinking, oh, is he going to be the next, you know, big-time thing? He, he wasn't that. He didn't look like that. And then you wonder, is this what his dad looked like at that point in time? Uh so when I went there, I didn't have expectations to put Ohio State next to his name or say he's going to be that type of player. But when that half was over, I was starting to think, wow, the motor on this kid, the explosion, uh, the desire. Uh, he was in the backfield for Princeton all night. He was coming off the ball and being disruptive. And a lot of times in one half, I don't see a kid necessarily put all those things on display. Uh, he's just an outstanding football player. So – for him, it was almost one of those players, if I take the name off the jersey and I say, this kid was a good enough football player to take a real consideration to him. And don't worry about the inch or two he's missing or him not being 270 pounds yet. He'll get there. He's a worker. He's a good player. So that's kind of the way I evaluated him. But I, I think he's a kid that's going to get better and better. And it wouldn't shock me if his offer list went through the roof this summer. Well, now we're going to turn to a, a ending segment, I guess you'd say. Last week, uh, again, you and I have been doing this for a long time. We talked about uh, two guys each that uh, we felt were the, the best players, the most impressive players in the state of Ohio that we had seen uh, since we started doing this. And in my case, I, uh, I named uh, Andy Katzenroyer, linebacker from Westerville South, and then I uh, also named Orlando Pace, the big O, and uh, you named Marshawn Lattimore, and if I remember correctly, Braxton Miller, I think was, was, your, yeah. or was your other one. Uh, we're going to go back again, but um, uh, we're going to go back kind of in honor of this being Ohio State Michigan week and uh, tell a little story, I guess, about uh, something Ohio State Michigan related since we've been doing this. And I'll start on this one. Um, uh, yeah, I started doing this in 1987. I had been uh, a teacher at Dublin High School, then Dublin High School, when it was just one big high school, one of the biggest high schools in Ohio, um, and the head basketball coach there. And I decided to go ahead and uh, give uh, basketball a little time off and started this business. So I started in 1987. So I had been doing this a few years before uh, this story happens. Um, Lloyd Carr was the coach at Michigan. He was there from 1995 to 2007 as Michigan's head coach. And again, I started doing this in 1987. So I've been doing this uh, around 10 years uh, before this happened. And, you know, I'm sitting at my desk just working one day and phone rings. And back in those days, it was the, the rotary dial type phone. Ring. So I pick up the phone and, and lo and behold, it's uh, the person in charge of recruiting for Michigan. And he introduced himself and all, and 
uh, I, you know, we, we talked for a few, few, few minutes and, uh, and then he got to the crux of why he was calling. He said that um, Lloyd Carr wanted him to call me because uh, Lloyd had heard or felt that I was calling high school players players at Ohio State and Michigan were recruiting. And of course, in those days, it was uh, a lot of the same guys, especially in the state of Ohio. Um, and he said that uh, we've heard that you're, you're telling them a lot of bad things about Michigan when you talk to them. And Lloyd wants you to stop that, that uh, that's not acceptable. And I was just kind of shocked. I was dumbfounded, really. I, I told him, I said, I've never inserted myself in the recruiting process. I'm just covering Ohio State. And actually, in those days, I was covering multiple schools, but Ohio State being one of them. And I, I explained to him I would never insert myself into the recruiting process. I'm calling them as part of my job. And I went on and told him that and all. And not really sure if he believed me or not. He, he, he basically said, well, let me talk to Lloyd Carr about this. And I said, OK, and uh, we'll, we'll talk again. So... Uh, I guess three or four days later, it was, um, we talked again, and he said, well, he said, Loy and I have talked about it, and we've decided that we're going to go ahead and believe you, and that we're going to uh, assume that you're not doing this, and believe what you say, and, and so on and so forth, and, and I was just kind of, you know, I guess I was happy that they were believing me, but the whole thing really was just a shocking episode that uh, I'll never forget the, the day that that happened and uh, um, never heard from them again, went on about my business and I guess approximately 25 years later now, still going at it. So that's kind of my Ohio State, Michigan story. Yeah, that's got to be surreal when you get that type of phone call, especially new into the business back then. And, you know, it really wasn't like it is today where there's so many websites and reporters, websites that weren't even invented. So that had to be really uh, unique. You know, as I was thinking about all the Ohio State stuff, you know, Jim Tressel, when he got the coaching job, since I'm from Youngstown, that always made it interesting. But I go back to college in the 1990s, and my roommate was from Fremont, Ohio. And all he did was talk about Charles Woodson before anyone knew who Charles Woodson was. And I'll never forget that Ohio State-Michigan game where or, uh, Desmond Howard and those guys did the Heisman, and then Charles Woodson came in. And it was just you know, at that time, it seemed like it could be anybody's game, and it was a closer game back then. And then as we get into this era, it doesn't seem like there's been a close game in a long time. And it's really, uh, you know, you, you I go to all these Michigan-Ohio State parties in the last decade, and by halftime, everyone's chatting and walking around and doing other things because the game isn't as close or as intense as it used to be. And there's nothing disrespectful about that. That's great for Ohio State. But, you know, going back to what I felt the most, you know, intensity about the game when you were the most nervous is, I guess, when you were in college and you were had your friends that did root for Michigan. And it really, you know, you were at that prime age where, you know, fandom is what you guys did in college. So those are my memories. But, you know, I get nervous about this week because to keep that streak alive, Michigan, you know, they've really – circled this date and almost made this year the year that they think they're going to do it. And I wonder, you know, if that emotion and that stuff comes into play this year. Well, I guess we're going to see in, uh, in a few days here up in Ann Arbor, but, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, watching both teams this year, I, I feel Ohio State is the better team. Better team doesn't always win, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think uh, I, I think Ohio State is the better team, and uh, obviously uh, there's no there's no uh, doubt about that. I just you know it's been so many years, and it just seems like this is like it for Harbaugh. He has to do this. It's something that the rest of their season doesn't matter. You know, I mean, in in more of a way than it doesn't matter for Ohio State. Ohio State's always thought this game more meant more than the season, but. You know, I, I just had a feeling like like in the 90s where anything could happen, and I haven't felt like that in a while. You know, I just haven't felt like Ohio State's been so dominant. It's almost like you just say, uh, what's the spread? I might want to bet this game. But, you know, I just broke down that Michigan State game, and the, the Ohio State offense is clicking on all cylinders. So what I'm seeing on film tells me this is a cakewalk. What my heart's telling me is there's a bear trap set up there, and you better be careful. And by the way, Mark was talking about breaking down that Ohio State Michigan State game. Uh, is Buckeye in the Sky that right now is on Bucknuts.com. It went up uh, uh, on uh, Tuesday, 
and it's on bucknuts.com and it's well worth watching. So uh, Bucknuts members, if you haven't watched it, check it out. But Mark, thanks for being with us again today. Yep. Appreciate it, Bill.